Good morning, everybody. Hello, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is Ellen Rosenblatt, and I am a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. Deidre Price, our social justice coordinator, is working with our local Tongva tribe on how we can ally with them. Please contact her if you would like to help with these efforts. Today is a very special service, and it is being led by our candidate for senior, senior minister, Dr. Reverend Omega Burkhart. Let's give Reverend Omega a huge neighborhood welcome. We are so excited to meet you. Reverend Omega. It's been a long time coming. Um, Reverend Dr. Omega Burkhart is currently the Assistant Minister at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Diego, serving their two campuses since 2021 through a period of change and transition. Prior to that, she served congreg congregations in Rockford, Illinois and Racine, Wisconsin. Before turning to ministry, Reverend Omega was a director and on the faculty in a university setting, building valuable experience in program administration, budgeting, training, and evaluation. Reverend Omega received her Master's, Masters of Divinity degree from Meadville Lombard Theological School, where she received the Faculty Award for Religious Leadership. Reverend Omega has been a trustee of the UUA Mid-Atlantic Region, trustee of the First Unitarian Church of Milwaukee, and chair of the Midwest Leadership School of the UUA. She currently serves as a board member of the Spirit Foundation. Reverend Omega was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and raised in a family of travelers. Her theology is heavily informed by earth-centered spirituality and religious naturalism. Buddhist and Taoist practice and a humanist understanding of the importance of our interconnection. <laughs> Reverend Omega is, is known for her interfaith connection and community building, along with her anti-oppression work and dedication to creating the beloved community. Today's music is provided by our music director, Dr. Zaneda Robles, and the fabulous Carnegie Hall Performing NUU Choir. <laughs> Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on guidance from our COVID safety team, each of us now decides whether to wear a mask and honors the decisions of others. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, the narthex, or in our new family lounge in the living room of Neighborhood House, where the service is live streamed on a big screen. As I mentioned before, this is Candidating Week for Reverend Omega and us. We call it Candidating Week <laughs> because the week is basically a week-long speed date for us and Reverend Omega. <laughs> she will be spending her time with as many neighborhood groups, committees, task ports, forces, and individuals as possible. She will be joined by their husband, Eric Heilig, and the family's very friendly and outgoing small dog companion, Jack-Jack, <laughs> who I kind of hope is a Jack Russell. No? Okay. Jack-Jack. <laughs> Today's service will be followed by a meet and greet with Reverend Omega on the patio, and I think there will be pastries available. Yay. <laughs> Not that we need those to draw us, right? <laughs> Through all the week, all members and friends are encouraged to join an in-person or online opportunity to meet Reverend Omega and begin to get to know each other. The calendar is available in today's email, the QR code on the back of your hymnal or on the patio. If timing is tricky, feel free to join any group. 
even though you're not part of that group. People with tenor or bass voices are especially encouraged to join the choir meet and greet. <laughs> and then stay for rehearsal. <laughs> All this leads up to next Sunday, April 30th, when Reverend Omega will be leading one service at 10 a.m. Again, next week there will only be one service at 10 a.m. Following that service, there will be a special congregation meeting to consider and vote to call Reverend Dr. Omega Burkhart as our senior minister. The meeting will be held in person and virtually. For this one simple vote, we are staying low tech and using paper ballots with a simple option for online participants. If you are unable to, if you are unable to attend, proxies can be completed online on the patio today after services, or they can be requested by contacting Elizabeth Campo in the office. Anyone who cares about the ministerial call and is committed to the church can vote. Following the congregational meeting next week, there will be a celebratory lunch. One, our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email, posted in the narthex or through the QR code in the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
That was beautiful. <laughs> we gather this morning in celebration of community in the foothills of mountain peaks covered with the wild blooms of flowers, a sure symbol of hope after cycles of drought and deluge. We gather this morning a community of fast friends, loving family, and souls who have not met yet, but still feel connected. We gather with gratitude for Mother Earth, the fresh morning air that delicately sways the mountain pines, the palms, and the bougainvillea. Gratitude for sky and sun that warms our smiling cheeks on the patio. We light this chalice, our own small sun that illuminates our worship space and reminds us of the cycles of our lives. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn is number 1067 in your teal hymnals or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing number 1067, Mother Earth, Beloved Garden. We'll sing all five verses. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. 
I'm Matt Vasco, Neighborhoods Director of Spiritual Exploration. And as a special treat for all of you today, uh, Reverend Omega would like to get to know our children and youth a little bit better. So she is going to tell our story for all ages. Yes. And with that, can we have our children and youth forward for a story for all ages, please? Well, very good morning to you. And I was just remarking before the service, I love the cushions that look like trees. That's so great. I'm Reverend Omega, and I get to read a story to you. So first, I'm going to ask you, if I hold it like this, can everybody see OK? Does that work OK? All right. This is called The Everything Seed, written by Carol Martignaco. Have you ever watched a seed grow? Have you ever watched a seed grow? Some of us have. Have you ever noticed how it begins so small? So still, so quiet, like a gift wanting to be opened? Who likes gifts? <laughs> and how slowly it wakes up, begins to unfold, growing into something larger? Here's a picture of the little seed way down here. Then it gets larger and larger. Then you know that whatever comes from a seed usually ends up looking very little like the seed it came from, which is also one of the very first seeds. Once, long ago, way back before the beginning, so long ago, there was no such thing as time because there was no one there to count it. Everywhere was a huge, deep, mysterious place, like something waiting to happen. There were no stars, no sun or moon. That would be disorienting to look up and not see that. There was no place like Earth, not a drop of water or a single tree or a rock or a flower, and no living beings anywhere. But in that deep waiting space was hidden the tiniest point of something no bigger than a seed. You just barely see it right here. You might call it an everything seed because that's what it became. No one knows where that first seed came from or how it was planted or how it knew in the way that only seeds seem to know how long to wait for just the right moment to sprout and grow. But all at once, this tiny seed cradled and nourished in the rich soil of space woke up, broke open, and began to unfold. Unfolding, unfolding, and blossoming forth. Into an enormous blazing ball of light. Like a great grandmother son. It is a time for all ages. <laughs> and the universe was born. Out fluttered the galaxies like a storm of snowflakes swirling and gathering into the brightest, most blindingly beautiful clouds of stars. And out of those star clouds whirled our own star, the one that we call the sun. And all the round spinning planets we have learned how to name And this is the secret of that tiny seed. 
you and I are we're there in the very beginning. Just as the idea for each leaf on a big oak tree lies hidden inside an acorn. We were there with all the stars and planets and all the rocks and the oceans, plants and animals and people, everything that is now, ever was, or ever will be was inside that first tiny seed. Isn't that amazing? A little bitty seed had everything. That's not real. It, it, is, it is incredible to think about, isn't it? I like to think of it as a story about what could have been. We don't know for sure, we can't know. Okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. So whenever you hold a seed, we can think about this. You can hold it in your hand and wonder what it could become. Maybe that would be a better question. What will the seed become? Imagine you, how you and all that is here once came from the tiniest little speck of an everything seed before it sprouted, and it grew long, long ago in the way back beginning of time. Now, if this were an ordinary story, it would end right here. It's always good to have questions, but this is the story of the universe, and it keeps unfolding. What once began in a blazing blossom of light continues every day. New stars sprout, open in the deep soil of space. New plants and animals appear on the earth. Seeds of many kinds are scattered all over the earth to help us remember. And new people are born every day with the spark of that first light still alive and burning deep inside. That spark waiting like the everything seed to shine in ways that are yet to be known. The end. Okay, so I'm going to invite our junior high youth group and our senior high youth group who's in the house. Where's my senior high? <laughs> They're being shy, it's okay. I do not even know what that means. High schoolers are cool, you know. They're not gonna, not gonna speak out, it's okay. Uh, well, junior high and senior high stay in so that you can get to know Reverend Omega a little bit better. Let's sing our children and youth up through fifth grade out to their spiritual exploration classes. is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. The offering today goes to Jericho Road, Pasadena. Spearheaded by members of this church, Jericho Road has become a vital link of support to Pasadena's nonprofit community. 
Here to speak on their behalf is Jericho Road's Executive Director, Kim Olpin. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ooh. Got a bigger response than this morning, so that's than earlier. <laughs> uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you all this morning, uh, and on such an exciting day as you get to meet your ministerial candidate. Um, as the executive director of Jericho Road Pasadena, I'm honored to speak with you once again about our organization and the value that we place on our partnership with a new UC community. Throughout my first year at Jericho Road, uh, I've had the opportunity to meet. Many of you who are active volunteers and supporters of JRP and your congregation's dedication to social justice and community service has made a really significant impact on so many people and we're really proud to be a part of this legacy. JRP was founded in this very church by members who saw a need for an organization like ours in the community. Uh, they raised the funds and developed the structure, and resulting in JRP's official opening in May of 2010. And it was a collaborative effort that involved countless hours of hard work and dedication uh, and unwavering commitment to making a difference. And since then, a member of this congrega congregation has always served on our board. Nearly half of our board members have come from this congregation, and that's a tradition that we really hope will continue. Uh, and it speaks to our shared values and commitment to community um, community building that both of our organizations embody. So I'm humbled to share with you the incredible work that JRP has, JRP has achieved in the, in the community since the founding from, out of this church. We've helped over 300 local nonprofits to achieve their missions by connecting them with skilled volunteers, board members, as well as board training. To date, we've facilitated over 2,200 volunteer connections, providing nearly 25,000 hour, volunteer hours to local no nonprofits worth over $2.3 million. We've completed nearly 700 projects, ranging from strategic plans to websites, uh, and NUUC members have directly volunteered on over 150 of these projects. So, uh, and some of these, some of the organizations that NUC members have volunteered at include uh, the Rose Bowl Aquatic Center, Pasadena Senior Center, Ability First, Pasadena Humane Society, Arlington Gardens, and Planned Parenthood. Uh, in addition to the skilled volunteer projects, we've matched 60 people onto nonprofit boards, 42% of whom are people of color, 60% under 55, which if any of you have served on a board, you know that that is very young. <laughs> uh, and we've hosted 18 workshops with over 1,000 participants. Because of your congregation, because of, of the work that you all have done, uh, JRP is now an integral part of the Pasadena nonprofit ecosystem, which if you haven't heard is kind of big. There's a few. <laughs> um, many nonprofits, uh, in our community still need the support. Most of the nonprofits we serve are under a million dollars and just can't afford to hire these skilled volunteers, which was the purpose of creating JRP. And so I'm, we're calling on you today to help continue our mission. Uh, we need your continued to support to, to provide the services we provide to the nonprofit community in Pasadena. As a nonprofit organization, we really rely on the generosity of people like you to keep our programs running. And every dollar you give to support us will also support the nonprofit community in Pasadena as a whole. So I understand times are a little weird and tough right now in the, out there in the world, um, but if there's one thing I think the pandemic has taught us is that we can achieve so much more together and by working together we can make a difference in the lives of our community uh, who need it most. So therefore today I'm asking for your support. Uh, please consider donating to JRP, but also consider signing up to volunteer or join a board or join a board training if you're not sure about joining a board yet. Um, whether you can donate your time or expertise or resources, your support will make a real life, a real difference in the lives of our community. Uh, and I can invite you to consider getting involved with us. If you have any questions uh, and would like to learn more about us, uh, if you haven't already, I'll be out on the patio afterwards. I know there's a lot going on right this week. Uh, so if you want to stop by and say hi, otherwise feel free to reach out to me at the office. But thank you so much for your time and support. Thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, and together I know we can make a real difference uh, in the world. So thank you for having me.
Will the volunteers please come forward?
Carnegie Hall. <laughs> hmm. I'd like to invite you into a moment of meditation or prayer of gratitude. As we sit quietly for this moment, connected to the earth below, the energy rising through our bodies, exiting our breath, entering. This prayer was written by Gary Snyder entitled, Prayer for the Great Family. Gratitude to Mother Earth, sailing through night and day, and to her soil, rich, rare, and sweet in our minds, so be it. Gratitude to plants, the sun-facing and light-changing leaf and fine root hairs, standing still through wind and rain, their dance is in the flowering spiral grain in our minds. So be it. Gratitude to air, bearing the soaring swift and silent owl at dawn. Breath of our song, clear spirit breeze in our minds. So be it. Gratitude to wild beings, our brothers and sisters, teaching secrets and freedoms and ways who share with us their milk, self-complete, brave and aware in our minds. So be it. Gratitude to water, clouds, lakes, rivers, glaciers, holding or releasing streaming through all our bodies, salty seas in our minds. So be it. Gratitude to the sun, blinding, pulsing light through trunks of trees, through mists, warming caves where bears and snakes sleep. He who wakes us in our minds. So be it. and gratitude to the great sky who holds billions of stars and goes yet beyond that, beyond all powers and thoughts, and yet is within us. Grandfather Space, the mind is his wife. Amen. So be it. We offer lift every voice and sing this morning in gratitude for this day and for the newness that's upon us. We acknowledge that this is commonly considered a Negro national anthem or the black national anthem. There's no need to stand for this concert version, but we honor that as we sing this anthem for you today.
and thus concludes my sermon. I, <laughs> I feel really good about where we're at right now. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, yesterday I drove from San Diego to Pasadena. It is a drive that does have moments of beauty <laughs> and some traffic, but there are moments of beauty. But yesterday revealed a whole new beauty as I could see the super bloom of California wildflowers. The hillsides in Camp Pendleton which is not an area I associate with life-giving <laughs> force. But the hillsides were just resplendent yesterday with yellows and oranges. The California poppies and all of the daisies made the hillsides look like velvet. Velvet carpets just sliding right into the sea. Lupines are erupting and succulents sprout flowers in crevices and rocky outcroppings on the side of the road. It was a beautiful way to mark my trip here to be with you on Earth Day. As you know, no one planted the flowers of the great super bloom that we're experiencing right now. Rather, it is occurring as a natural part of a cycle of drought and rain, a reminder of nature's gardening and cycles that weave to create tapestries made of the infinitesimal, the small seed that can later, in its culminating resplendence, be observed from space. California poppy seeds lying dormant for years in dry soil only to burst forth with such a magnitude that the mountains are flame orange from miles, miles, miles away in the sky. Thinking on this relationship to tending gardens and natural landscapes and the arrival of spring, I am reminded of a quote from Grace Lee Boggs, naturalist and community activist. She gave this quote in an interview with Bill Moyers on 60 Minutes. She said, a garden does all sorts of things. It helps young people to relate to the earth in a different way. It helps them relate to their elders in a different way. It helps them think of time in a different way. Boggs was born to Chinese immigrant parents, and she became a key community organizer in the civil rights movement of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But later, she championed community gardening as a way to organize in Detroit. Her community garden project continues, continues to foster new or maybe just reimagined ways to nurture ourselves amidst food scarcity and industrial blight and decayed human bonds, de decayed bonds between ourselves and nature as well. And I've been thinking about this quote from Grace Lee Boggs about what it suggests about our relationships with other living organisms in our lives and our relationships to our elders and to our youth. About what it means to live mindfully and attentive to natural cycles and food sources. In the upper Midwest, before moving to a small apartment in Southern California a few years ago, this would have been the season when I started cultivating seeds in my kitchen, because it's still too cold to plant there. I usually plant a few kinds of peppers and a particular kind I like from northern Spain that like it a little bit cooler. Some herbs, maybe some tomatoes, and a smattering of other plants that honestly varies by year and whim. Now this also would have been the season of the great houseplant migration. Uh, those of you who have lived in colder climates, either in the Midwest perhaps or on the East Coast, you know that this is when we move the large house plants that have spent the winter inside. They've been tucked in south-facing windows 
perhaps strung with holiday lights to mimic the sun's rays in the darkest days of winter, which seem like they will never end in Wisconsin <laughs> in February. <laughs> One particular plant has the most revered status in our house. This is a ficus tree that stands between eight and nine feet tall. It takes several humans to move her outside and this plant is a her. Just feels right. First, we move her across the dining room and I just, to put this in perspective, you have to understand I live in Milwaukee in a hundred old craftsman bungalow. So some of you are familiar with that. So we first move her through the dining room, then the living room, across the front porch, down the steps, and around the side of the house where she gets hosed off and trimmed, gets a haircut perhaps treated for bugs or scale or the myriad of cobwebs that undoubtedly cover her leaves. And there in the dappled light of a king crimson maple tree on our south lawn, she thrives in the summer months until she is carried, pulled, and wrestled back into the house in the fall, hopefully before the first frost She's hardy enough that she's made it through the first one that takes us by surprise sometimes. Now, this plant is not native to Wisconsin, to be sure, and probably not native, for sure, not native to south-facing but still shaded windows of craftsman bungalows. But perhaps it's because of this I am particularly attentive to her needs feeling a bit bad that perhaps she would rather be living out her life in a jungle somewhere. So imagine my delight a few years ago when I moved to Southern California and saw this exact same kind of ficus that I have been coaxing along for multiple decades of my life, just growing in the ground. <laughs> Perhaps this great potted ficus will make a final migration here, and I can set it free <laughs> to frolic <laughs> with its cousins in the mountain foothills. I am a religious naturalist. I find the holy in cycles of nature, the great beyond and how I fit in it in the spaces and the places and time of the world of which I am a part. We all are a part. The cycles of nature guide the cycles of my own life. And the sacred for me is found in the wonders of the grasshoppers in the lawn and the tiny ants and also the unfathomably large cosmos that I can't see and I don't understand. This intersection of cycles of time and connection to specific places and the immensity and peculiarly infinitesimal all texture, my concept of the divine. It comes as no surprise then that I find a tremendous connection with the mindfulness found in nature writing as well as with holidays and rituals that mark the arrival of new seasons. Indeed, many of us may have been brought to Unitarian Universalism by Henry David Thoreau or the writings of Annie Dillard, and I would guess that there are many amongst us who find the poetry of Mary Oliver to be about as close as we get to sacred text. Ursula Goodenough's collection, The Sacred Depths of Nature, is my Bible. She approaches nature and its cycles and orders of magnitude with religiosity. Goodenough is a professor at Washington University in St. Louis and the former president of the American Society of Cell Biology. She writes that her Methodist minister's father's search for why people are religious informed her earliest explorations into zoology and biology and physics. 
In this collection, she explores amoebas and bio biocellular diversity, natural selection, eukaryotes, on and on, with a religious reverence. She writes, we are all, each one of us, ordained to live out our lives in the context of ultimate questions, such as, why is there anything at all rather than nothing? Where did the laws of physics come from? Why does the universe seem so strange? She goes on to say, my response to such questions has been to articulate a covenant with mystery. Others, of course, prefer to respond with answers, answers that often include a concept of God. These answers are, by definition, beliefs, since they can be neither proven or refuted. The only important part, she says, is that the questions be openly encountered. To take the universe on, to ask, why are things the way they are? is to generate the foundation for everything else. And then we come to understand that it is perfect because we arose from it and are part of it. Hosanna, not in the highest, but right here, right now, this. Goodenough observes in nature the culmination of the divine, inspired by wonder at the minute and the expansive, by the amoeba and the ends of the observable universe. It was in the context of reading her work that I first became a student of Robin, excuse me, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Some of you may have read her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. She is a celebrated botanist, a distinguished teaching professor at the State University of New York, and a member of the Potawatomi tribe. She writes, to be native to a place, we must learn to speak its language. I come here to listen, to nestle in the curve of roots in a soft hollow of pine needles to lean my bones against the column of white pine, to turn off the voice in my head until I can hear the voices outside it. The shh of the wind in the needles, water trickling over rock, nut hatch tapping, chipmunks digging, beech nut falling, mosquito in my ear, and something more something which is not for me or is for me, for which we have no language, the world, excuse me, wordless being of others in which we are never alone. She goes on to say, after the drumbeat of my mother's heart, this was my first language. I could spend a whole day listening and a whole night and in the morning without my hearing it, there might be a mushroom that was not there the night before. Creamy white, pushed up from the pine needle duff, out of the darkness into light, still glistening with the fluid of passage. Popowi, Popowi. My first taste of the missing language, she writes, my first taste was the word Popowi. I stumbled on it in a book by the Anishinaabe ethnobotanist Kiwadinoke, a treatise on the traditional uses of fungi by our people. Popowi, she explained, translates as the force which causes mushrooms to push up overnight. What a beautiful word. I love that word. It captures life force in our natural world, the changes that take place, and if we're mindful to them, spark wonder. Popowi, the divine, the sacred life force that pushes up the mushrooms overnight. 
These meditations make me think about the relationship to the seedlings I often start in my kitchen windowsill, early spring aspirations of peppers and tomatoes. Perhaps some of you have had that experience where you plant the seeds and you wait, and then you wait some more, and it seems like they're never gonna come up. And then you go into your kitchen and you look, and there's a little seedling, and it happened and you didn't see it. Popoe. Popoe. The infinitesimal life forms in the dirt, and that dirt was likely originally star stuff, like us humans, star stuff living our lives on this planet. I love that. I find it exultant. I find that comforting. We are manifestations of space and time, stardust with a certain rootedness. We are everything seeds on this planet. I think about space and time a lot during the great plant migration season in my house too. You see that eight foot ficus I was describing earlier that I have lovingly been taking care of for years was actually my mother's. And she brought it home with her the year that I was born. And while I would love to say that I am only a mere decade or two old, <laughs> it has been around for several decades. I grew up as an only child as well. And so somehow that tree was my sibling Robin Wall Kimmerer makes a play on words when she describes the word for being, which is the Anishinaabe word, A-K-I, Aki. And she says, maybe we could think of that A-K-I word, Aki, as kin, our natural world being kin on this earth. So in a few weeks, some of you may know, my husband still lives in Milwaukee. He's getting ready to move that ficus outside for me. I will also be thinking of my mother during that time, her love of plants and gardening. And now I came to the realization recently that my children who are almost 18 and 21 now have grown up with that plant as well. They have watched us <clears throat> and sometimes participated in carrying her outside. <laughs> it is a family affair, it takes many of us. Perhaps they have watched me be attentive to her green leaves or the texture of her knotted trunk. I have all sorts of connections through space and time to other elders with that tree, to other trees, to other seeds, and to other soil critters, and other stardust. And that is religious naturalism. That is to be mindful in religious naturalism, being mindful to all of these processes, somehow it has the converse effect. We become most rooted in our present. To embrace the unfolding of time in cycles of our lives, to feel that connection with our kin, the animals and the plants that have defined our spaces and our places. And we carry all of those inside of us like little seeds little seeds that will perhaps grow into a big leafy ficus, or maybe like mushrooms that will sprout in the shade of a mountain pine tree, or maybe that life force that is our children and our grandchildren who will grow to change the world beyond our knowing, or maybe that little seed is like the poppies of the California super bloom after a drought. So I'd like to end my remarks today with a poem. And the poem's title is Shaking the Tree. Now, those of you who have houseplants, perhaps you have heard this. If not, here is a gardening tip for you. Did you know that you are supposed to shake your houseplants? Because the shaking mimics the buffeting wind. It makes those plants remember what it's like to grow soil, grow roots deep into the soil. I'll share this with you, Shaking the Tree by Jean Lohman. Vine and branch, we're connected in this world of sound and echo, figure and shadow, 
the leaves contingent, roots pushing against earth. An apple belongs to itself, to stem and to tree, to air that claims it, then ground. Connections balance, each motion changes another, precarious, hanging together. We don't know what our lives support. And we touch in the least shift of breathing. Each holy thing is borrowed because everything depends. May it be so. Eight in your teal hymnals are on the screens above. above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing Rising Green, number 1068. Rising Green. A final benediction before we go out to the beautiful sun. Beauty is before me and beauty behind me. Above me and below me hovers the beautiful. I am surrounded by it. I am immersed in it. In my youth, I am aware of it. And in my old age, I shall walk quietly the beautiful trail. In beauty it is begun, in beauty it is ended. Beauty for you on this lovely day. May it be so. Mm -hmm.